Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Uh, just a second so that you appear on the screen. Great. You're sharing your screen, so everything's good. Okay. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pasco, for the introduction. So every day when we read emails, browse Facebook, or have a talk with colleagues via Zoom, our security is ensured by Authenticated Encryption, or AE, a tool that delivers both privacy and authenticity. The conception of AE emerged in the year 2000 as a way to add authenticity to classical encryption, and it then quickly moved from theory to practice. Since then, there have been a number of efforts in strengthening the original notion, such as unique nonce AE or misuse resistant AE. These efforts have led into widely used schemes in the TOS, IPsec, and many other network protocols. Still, despite the huge volume on AE works, Essentially, everything still falls under the umbrella of privacy and authenticity. And there have been a long held belief that these notions are enough for practical purposes. Surprisingly, in a recent attack known as the partitioning Oracle attack, Len, Grubbs, and Ristenbach shatter this common belief. They demonstrate a break of standard encryptions in the context of password-based encryption. So in this setting, the adversary tries to exploit a server as a decryption oracle to recover passwords. Strangely, the attack has nothing to do with authenticity or privacy of the encryption scheme. Instead, the adversary tries to find some form of multi-collisions on the server text of passwords in a dictionary. If we can find an S-way multi-collision, it can speed up by a factor of S compared to a brute force attack. And for standard encryption schemes, S can be as big as thousands, making the attack practical. So the partitioning Oracle attack demonstrate that in contrary to common belief, privacy and authenticity are not enough. And it's not the only place where things go wrong. Consider Facebook message franking. So he, Alice and Bob have an encrypted conversation via Facebook Messenger. Now, thanks to end-to-end -end encryption, Facebook doesn't know your key anymore. Still, it allows you to report abuse but you have to send the decryption key for verification. Unfortunately, there's a way to break this mechanism by sending a fake key and associated data. It can turn Alice's benign message into a malicious one, and she would be wrongly penalized for that. Again, this has nothing to do with privacy or authenticity because the adversary, both in this case, knows the key. Instead, what we need here is a new notion known as committing security. Informally, this means that the server attack should be a commitment of the key. And for some applications, such as message franking, you want to commit the message as well. Although committing security is new, it captures what practitioners intuitively think about encryption schemes. Unfortunately, this intuition is not supported by any standard-based schemes. Yet, it is urgently demanded by many applications, such as subscribe with Google or the OPEC uh, password-based key exchange. There have been a couple of works on formalizing committing security. But if you look closely, everybody speaks a slightly different dialect. 
some wants to commit just the key. Some wants to commit everything. Some work deals with the old fashioned probabilistic AE. Some deals with the standard the unique nonce AE. Ado even defies a new type of AE with a different syntax. So there's currently a lack of a unified systematic treatment for committing security. And partly because of this, current solutions are somewhat frustrating. Earlier schemes tend to be pretty slow, as slow as hashing the message. Recent schemes are faster, but you consume more bandwidth than necessary, say two additional blocks per message. In addition, why unique non A schemes like GCM receive a lot of attention from both industry and academia. There has been no effort in fixing misuse resistant A schemes like AES TCM SIP. So in this work, we give a systematic treatment for committing notions. And based on that, we build generic transforms UTC and RTC for unique nonce and misuse resistant AE. The UTC transform is a generalization of a prior work by Albertini at all, but it allows a more efficient instantiation. Now, why UTC and RTC works generically? They still demand one additional block per ciphertext, and our overhead for small messages is still large. To bridge the performance gap, we build committing variants of TCM and AES TCM SIV. Compared to the original schemes, these variants introduce very tiny changes. There's no self tech expansion, and the overhead is very little. Moreover, let me mention that prior work on committing security only provide analysis in a single user setting. In contrast, here we provide strong multi-user analysis for all schemes in our paper. Now let me give you a visual comparison on the performance of our unique non schemes, CUC1 and UTC, with a prior work of Albertini et al. that is deployed on Amazon Cloud. Now as illustrated by the picture, our schemes are a lot more efficient than the prior work and for CUC1, the overhead is negligible, even for small messages. And the same trend continues for our misuse resistance schemes. Now, in today's talk, I'll introduce the framework of committing notions, and I'll show you how to achieve that in the context of CCN. But before we get into that, uh, let me begin by briefly reviewing the syntax of AE schemes. So syntactically, an AE scheme consists of an encryption algorithm and a decryption one, both deterministic. Encryption text as input a key K, a message M, a nonce N to produce a self text C. Conversely, decryption text the key, a self text and a nonce to produce either a message M or a symbol indicating invalidity. They also take an additional argument known as associated data or AD. It is a string that for some reason cannot be encrypted, but still should be authenticated. For example, if you encrypt network packages, then you cannot encrypt the headers because routers need to see that to move to the next half. So in that context, your message would be the payload and your AD would be the headers. In practice, the AD is often short. For example, IP headers are at most 60 bytes. Now let me give you an overview on the committing definitions. It turns out that there's no one size fits all notion, but a hierarchy of definitions. At the bottom, 
we have the commit one notion that commits just the key guy. And that's enough for the partitioning Oracle attack. At the very top, we have the commit for notion that commits every for all the four components in a tuple KNAM. And that is demanded by message franking. In between, we define an intermediate notion at commit tree that commits the three components KNA. Now it turns out that the commit three and commit four notions are equivalent. Informally, once you can commit KNA, the message M is automatically committed thanks to the correctness of decryption. But there's a definitional separation between commit one and commit three. And this matters not just for security, but also for efficiency, because it turns out that the top two notions require hashing the ID, but the bottom one doesn't. Luckily, in practice, ID is short, so we can realize commit for security in a cheaper way than hashing the message and the ID as many current solutions. Now let me uh, describe the definitions in more details. So here the adversary needs to produce two tuples, K1, N1, A1, M1, and K2, N2, A2, M2. Its goal is to produce a collision when we encrypt these tuples. Now to avoid trivial wins, the commit one notion requires that the keys be distinct. Commit four is more relaxed. It requires that the two tuples are different. Now here, the adversary wants to produce a collision. We can generalize the definition a little bit, requiring that the adversary needs to produce an S-way multi-collision instead of a mere collision. But now let's take a step backward and think about that notion. It seems that somehow the generalization is redundant. In fact, if the adversary cannot produce a collision, surely it cannot produce a multi-collision. So the special definition already implies the general one. So why bother to generalize? So it turns out that the generalization gives us a trade-off for resisting partitioning or attack. Now let's say that you, if there's no collision whatsoever, then our schemes can only deliver the standard birthday bow in committing security. But if your applications can tolerate a little speed up in the password guessing, then we can deliver much better security, say 96 bit security. Now remember that there are two main notions, commit four and commit one. One wants to commit just a key. The other wants to commit everything. Now it turns out that once you can commit the key, it's easy to commit everything else. And we achieve that via a genetic transform that we call hash then encrypt. In particular, here we have a base A scheme that is commit one secure. And we want to leverage it somehow to, come to obtain commit for security. Now remember that commit for means that you need to commit K and A. Once you can do that, the message M is automatically committed. So our first step is to hash K and A to derive a synthetic key. We then use that synthetic key to include the message M. Now, because the base A scheme commits the synthetic key. So the cybertax is a commitment of K and A if the hash function is collision resistant. And as a result, the overall construction has commit for security. Now, let me stress that here, the ID is processed only once because in the encryption, we encrypt with an empty ID. So the hash the encrypt transform has no ceratex expansion. And actually its overhead is optimal. 
Remember that commit four demands hashing the ID, whereas commit one doesn't. So here the hashing cost of KNA is somehow unavoidable. Security wise, if the hash function is a good PIF, then the transform preserves both unique nonce and misuse resistance security for the AE scheme. And as I mentioned earlier, if the hash function is collision resistant, then the transform promotes commit one security to commit four. So now we have a nice way to obtain commit four if we know how to get commit one. So now what's left is to see how to get commit one in a clean way. And I will show you how to do that in the context of GCM. So remember that commit one means that you need to commit the key somehow. So the intuition is that you need to hash the key, probably with something else, and then include the image in the ciphertext. But how long should the hash output be? The conventions would tell you that you need something like 256 bit output <coughs> to prevent off-fly attacks. Why? Here we don't want an adversary to spend a lot of pre-computation to get a collision and then attack the committing security with anybody with constant cost per user. But if you look at the uh, applications of committing security more closely, then typically one key is the random sample and that rules out the offline attacks. So actually here, you only need one to eight bit output. Moreover, here you only deal with a very short input, the key K. So you actually don't need a fully fleshed cryptographic hash function. So in our paper, we instead use the Davis Mayer construction on AES. Davis Mayer is known to provide good collision resistance in the ideal cipher model. And in our work, we show that it continues to provide good multi collision resistance. <coughs> Even better, that's the best you can hope for from a one to day bit output hash function. So you have a good way to hash the key. But how would you include the hash image without expanding the server text? <coughs> In order to answer that question, let me now give you a bird eyes view of TCM. So remember that TCM is basically encrypted and Mac. So here the encryption scheme is counter mode and the Mac follows the counter workman paradigm. In particular, in the Mac, you first use a universal hash function known as key hash to process the self text call C and the ID. And you then use a one time path to encrypt the key hash output to derive tag T. Now let's zoom in the Mac construction a little bit further. And the one time path is produced by making a call to the block cipher. So in our scheme CAUC1, instead of using a one-time path, we directly use the block cipher to encrypt the GH output. It is also a very common variant of the Carter Wegman. It has authenticity, but itself doesn't have committing security. To make it committing, we add an extra XR, turning the block cipher call into the Davies Mayer construction. And now the tag T becomes a commitment of the key K. As a result, the commits one security of CUC1 can be reduced to the multi collision resistance of the Davy Mayer construction. For unique non security, CUC1 retains the security of GCM. Actually, for short tags, the situation is even better. GCM is known to be very poor if the, the tags are short, but CUC1 doesn't have any such issue. 
So even if the applications don't need committing security, there might be a good reason to switch from GCM to CAUC1. Summing up, given urgent demands from many applications, we believe that it's time to upgrade encryption standards to committing ones. The variance in our work allows us to do that with tiny changes. There would be no cyber attack expansion and overhead is little. And the transition for AS GCMS IV is particularly attractive because the scheme is new, there's not much legacy issue. And what you need here is just an extra XR. Thank you for listening to my talk and I'm happy to take questions now. Viet Tong? Yes. No, no, I'm just asking in the room if there are questions for you. All right. So Mike, okay, yeah, good. All right, uh, Jeremiah Blocky, Purdue University. Uh, so uh, you mentioned uh, that you don't need 256 bit uh, hash outputs for 128 bit security. Um, I was curious. Uh, um, is this inherent if we require s equals one or is this just a feature that we can exploit when the number of multi collisions is larger than larger than two okay so uh for the actually for the base case where s is two namely a mere uh, ordinary collision then we can only provide burst day bio security but if you look at the base schemes gcm or so they only provide birthday bow. So in the basic setting where S is two, then you have vertical security. But as uh, I visualize in the slides, let me see. Where is, um, here, do you see the screen? So if you allow a bigger S, say S is four or so, then you have 96 feet of security. And the bigger okay. the S is, uh, the better security value you have. Okay, okay. So um, I guess if we want no speed up though in password guessing, we still have to go back to 256 bits? Um, if, if you want uh, one to day bit security, then probably so. Okay. But, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? If not, then uh, let's thank uh, Viet Tong again.